All right. So part five, this is the biblical timeline corruption. And now we're really starting to get to the nitty gritty of the impact of the Masoretic text. Of course, hopefully you've seen the impact so far, and there's a lot of impact, but this is a very important issue because it concerns legitimizing the Bible. And there are many atheistic arguments against the legitimacy of the Bible because of the Masoretic text. So now that you understand the Egypt, Egypt slavery issue and the narrative there and all the numerical issues going on and how to hunt for the truth, we can get some deeper things with bigger consequences on our plate. This ties into some other important topics like defending Jesus as the high priest and the end times, which we're going to be defending. The issue is this, folks. The issue is that in the Masoretic text, you have about 750 years of missing history that were removed from the genealogy of the patriarchs in Genesis 11. This affects many things. So today we're going to start with the pyramids to give you an objective point of reference to see what the problem is and then go from there. So what's the problem? Well, creationists say that the flood was around 20, 2350 BC. However, Egyptologists agree, consensus, that the pyramids were built around 2, uh, 2550 BC. The pyramids have no water damage and no damage from water at all. Like There's no evidence to suggest that they were built before the flood. So something's wrong. Skeptics say that the flood never happened. See, all these creationists have a date of 2350 BC for the flood, but the pyramids were built before that, yet they have no water damage. Therefore, the Bible's wrong. That's what they're arguing. So this is a major problem. Either the creationists are wrong about their date for the flood, or the Bible's wrong. So we have to make sure we have the right answer here and defend our beliefs. The pyramids are built on sediment layers that have been laid by the flood. So it's very obvious that they were built after the flood. Also, Egypt in Hebrew is Mizraim, who was the grandson of Noah, who was the son of Ham. So genealogically, because nations are named after individuals, it would stand to reason that Egypt happened, it was built after the flood. So something isn't adding up here because we know that the Bible has no error. We also know very importantly that the Bible is a revelation from God. I mentioned this before, and it's perfect. Of course, translations are an issue, and this is the issue of today. Translations are the things that have sometimes errors, as you can clearly see. Sometimes they have poor word choices, and we need to discern the truth because we know God is perfect. We know he's sovereign and he preserves his word, and we know that the information he's revealed about himself is perfect. He can't make errors. So something is amiss here. Something's amiss with the, with the translation possibly that's being used. And of course, that's the Masoretic text. So we want to find the core information. We don't want to settle for the translation. Do not settle for the translation. Always do your due diligence. Now, patterns of evidence, which I just mentioned, their archaeology research, uh, they, they won 13 film festival awards. They, they're very prolific archaeological work. I highly recommend them. If you're into archaeology, check them out. Don't look for stuff with Ron Wyatt. Look for people who are actually doing research. Patterns of Evidence. Um, I've, I've cited Expedition Bible also on YouTube. He does an amazing job. I think his book on our biblical archaeology is like number one in Amazon and archaeology. Great guy. Great research. There's legitimate people legitimizing the Bible all the time. You don't need Ron Wyatt. Anyway, that's a tangent. But Patterns of Evidence... 13 Phil Festival Awards discovered that Egyptian history is off by 200 years for various reasons, doesn't matter, but it's off by 200 years, which means that the actual pyramid date is not 2550 BC, but 2350 BC, around the time the creationists say the flood happened. Well, that doesn't really solve the problem though, because you have other questions that you need to ask. Like for example, when did the Tower of Babel happen? When did people have time to build up into a giant nation and create the pyramids? The step pyramid of Saqqara is 100 years older than the Great Pyramids, so you still have issues because now, even if you move the date to 2350 BC, the problem is that you have this step pyramid of Saqqara, which is the oldest one, I believe. That one's 2450 BC, so that one has to be before the flood. So it doesn't work. Something is missing. We still have a major problem. 
So the only conclusion is that the biblical timeline is the issue. But we know the Bible's perfect, so what is the problem? The problem is the Masoretic text, as you have hopefully seen by now. So, in Genesis 11, the ages of the patriarchs are very different, and we're going to look at that right now. We're going to do a parallel comp comparison, just so you can see. This is Genesis 11, verse 10 through about 26. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpaxad. Okay, when Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpaxad. So these two align. Then you have Shem lived after he fathered five, Arpaxad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. This one's the same, 500 years. When Arpaxad lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. When Arpaxad lived 135 years, he begot Canaan. Now we'll talk about Canaan in just a second. This is an interesting issue. But the point is what? Arphaxad was 135 when he had his next child, versus 35 in the Masoretic text. And Arphaxad lived after 430, 403 years, and he begot other sons and daughters. This one goes on about Canaan, and Canaan begot Sela. Of course, in, this, in the Masoretic text, Arphaxad begot Sela. And you'll see that this Canaan might not, this might not be... This might be an error in the Septuagint. We'll talk about it. But either way, when Canaan uh, was 130 years, he begot Selah. So there's added time there. When, Shela, when Selah lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. Septuagint says, and Selah lived 130 years. Shelah lived after he fathered Eber four and three years and begot of the sons. Heber, uh, Sela lived after he begot Heber 330 years and begot sons. So there's different times that they lived, but they're, the main thing is being the difference is when they had the children. When Heber lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Heber lived 134 years and fathered Peleg. So they've, they, they've taken hundreds of years out of these particular verses. This is verse 18. When Peleg lived 30 years, he fathered Rio, and Peleg lived 130 years and begot Rigal, Rio Rigal. There's different names for the same person, but they're the same thing. So this is the problem, folks. This is the problem, is that if you go through this whole thing, the ages are different. There's about 600 years, give or take, of missing history because the ages of the patriarchs, when they had their children, are manipulated. People think that, well, what's the big deal? You will see there's a very big deal. So if we go to... Um, a little graphic here. Okay, here we go. This is taken from a really good presentation on the on this topic, and you'll see also in Gen Answers in Genesis has the same graphic. But this is the problem. So as it's currently laid out in the Masoretic text, keep this in mind: Shem lives long enough to meet Abraham. This is a very important issue. But you can see all these people based on the Masoretic text when they had their children. And based on when they died, none of them, like Shem outlived practically everybody. So this is the ages that you have as a result of these ages reported to you in the Masoretic text. This is Answers in Genesis, who's very well known for their creationist leanings and, and teachings. And they're talking about this same topic. It is hard to imagine that Abraham could have spoken to Shem, Noah's son, who surely talked to his great-grandfather Methuselah, who in turn could have spoken to Adam, the first man, directly. Not true. This is Jewish fables. Although the Bible never records that Adam and Methuselah or Abraham and Shem met, because they didn't, that possibility is likely. Consider the other patriarchs that could have talked to one another. And they give you this fancy chart and say, look, you know, these are the ages, and it seems really legit. You know, like you're looking at this, and you see here Shem, here's Shem, and he's living basically past everyone. Here's Abraham. So you see Shem and Abraham basically are intersecting, but everybody else except for Eber is dead. So Shem got to see the death of his son, his grandson, his great-grandson, his great-great-great-grandson, like, you know, six, seven generations over and until he saw Abraham. So the question is, why would God put Shem, first off, through the death of all of his great-grandsons and all his family? That's pretty, that's pretty horrible, right? To outlive all of these people. And of course, the calculations that these people are using are based on the Masoretic, which was originally made by James Usher, a man that was an Irish, Irish archbishop 
he was a very well-known scholar. I think in the 1600s, I could be wrong, I, I forget what year, but he's, you know, qu quite a few centuries ago. But he used the Masoretic text. And so again, tradition, tradition gives you this, but you're not using a good tradition, you're using Pharisee tradition to come to the truth. And you'll see what the agenda behind changing these ages was, because it's a very sinister agenda. When you use the Septuagint uh, numbers, everyone died before their sons, meaning everybody had normal life expectancy. I don't mean normal life expectancy in the terms of how long they lived. I mean, in the expectancy that you wouldn't outlive your children. You understand? So when you apply the actual ages, if we go back to our little graph here, this is a graph that's done with the actual times from the Septuagint, you can see this is much more realistic. Shem went from here to here, Arphaxad here to there. You know, Shem did not outlive his son. Arphaxad did not outlive his son. Shelah did not outlive Eber. Eber did not outlive Peleg. Nobody outlived anybody in terms of their son. Every father died before their son. And Shem died about 500 years before Abraham. There was no contact between Shem and Abraham. And you will learn again why this is so important. So at a minimum, 600 years of history is missing. Now, there are some other things that we need to talk about. Let's talk about the missing Canaan that I mentioned previously in Genesis 11. In Genesis 11 verse 12, you have this Canaan that's mentioned here. Arphaxad lived 135 years and begot Canaan. Whereas in the Masoretic, it says that Arphaxad fathered Shelah. And then in the Septuagint, it says Arphaxad fathered Canaan, and then Canaan lived so on and so far, then he fathered Shelah, Selah. So the question is, is, is this another person that we need to add to the genealogy that's not there? Well, in Luke's genealogy, which is interesting, this is Luke 3, verse um, 35 to 36, he mentions Canaan. The son of Sarug, the son of Rio, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arvaxad. So this particular, if you go to, like the ESV, I wonder if the KJV does it. Um, you see, the, the KJV, oh yeah, the KJV does have Canaan. So the KJV also has this error. Yeah, so Luke's genealogy has Canaan, and here's the issue. First off, in the genealogies in Genesis 11, it says the Canaan lived for 130 years. Or does it say this? Um, parallel. Canaan, yada, 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 and Canaan lived 130 years. So potentially, there could be yet another 130 years on top of the 600 already missing. However, the problem is this. The oldest copies of the Septuagint do not include this additional Canaan. The oldest copies of the New Testament from Luke do not include Canaan in the genealogy. The Samaritan Pentateuch doesn't include Canaan. Josephus doesn't include this genealogy with Canaan as well. So it's very clear that that's not the case. We also have a testimony from the Old Testament itself, 1 Corinthians, or Chronicles 1.18, and you can see that even the Septuagint testifies against itself in that sense, where you have these genealogies, the sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Selah, you know, uh, Eber, Felig, Regan. So there's no Canaan here. So in this sense, the Septuagint probably very likely has a scribal error in this particular case in Genesis, in Genesis, uh, Genesis 11 with the extra Canaan. And the older, or I should say the younger manuscripts of Luke, followed that Septuagint error and added the Canaan in there. It's very likely that that's probably not the case, but if it is, that would be another 130 years or so of missing history. It could be possible, but given the evidence and how many witnesses agree, again, Josephus, the oldest copies of the Septuagint, other places in the Septuagint, like the Old Testament, in Chronicles, um, the Samaritan Pentateuch, older copies of Luke, all these witnesses agree. So very likely it's probably a scribal error. So not a big deal, but again, just so you realize the process of discerning the truth with these things, because you're dealing with translations, folks, 2,000 plus years of history is a lot to consider. However, there is the issue of Nahor, Genesis 11, verse 24 to 25. In the Masoretic, it says, And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. Or, he said, 24. 
When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. In the Septuagint, it says, And Nahor lived 179 years and begot Terah. And Nahor lived after he had begotten Terah 125 years and begot sons and daughters. So Nahor, did he have Terah at 29 years old? Or did he have him at 179 years old? There's 150 years of missing history based on which translation you choose. Now, the Samaritan Pentateuch has a different one, which is, again, kind of interesting. It says, And Nahor lived 79 years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah 69, 69 years, 60 and 9 years, yeah, and begat sons and daughters, and they were all the days of Nora, 88 and 40 years and 100. So 184 years, and he is dying. So what's, what is the point here? Well, the Septuagint, or the, um, the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, gosh, the English here is just so weird because the order of the words they use is t totally different. But Samaritan Pentateuch says that Terah lived for a total of 148 years, which matches the Masoretic total. If we look at the Masoretic text, where's the Masoretic text? So Nahor lived 29 years, this is Masoretic, or before he had Terah, and then after that he lived 119 years, which comes out to 148. So the total amount that Nahor lived, according to the Masoretic text, is 148 years, which the Samaritan Pentateuch matches. But it doesn't match the time that he had Terah at. It says he had him at 79 years when he fathered Terah and lived, whatever, 69 years after that. So there's a 50-year difference. So that's interesting because, again, the, Masoret, the Septuagint says he lived 179 years before he begot his son Terah. And then after that, he lived another 125 years. So he lived, you know, what, 300-something years. Much more time has passed, according to the Septuagint. So the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Masoretic have a total that's the same, which is 148 years, but they disagree on when Terah was born. It seems that the Samaritan Pentateuch dropped 100 years or so from Nahor's uh, timeline. Probably a scribal error. Maybe it's the early signs of the genealogy conspiracy. Who knows? Septuagint is 100 years older than the Samaritan Pentateuch. Septu the Samaritan Pentateuch agrees with the Septuagint in many other places. So it's probably a scribal error. You never know. I'm not going to make a claim either way. I think it's more likely that this is a scribal error because there are other things that the Samaritan Pentateuch agrees with. However, it is an error because the Septuagint is the superior source, and we can see very clearly that everybody believed that. Everybody quoted the Septuagint. So what's the point? Well, the point is that you now have a minimum of 750 years of missing history due to the Masoretic corruption. Now, here's a bonus mistake for you just to log it in your list of why the KJV onlyism is nonsense, but it's the age of King Ahaziah. This is just another example. Just another example because people love to use the KJV as this, you know, absolute truth, but the KJV has errors, folks, and this is an example of an error, an actual error, because they use the Masoretic. 2 Chronicles 21, verse 20. It says, we'll go to the KJV so you can just see what it says. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years and departed without being desired. Howbeit they buried him in the city of David, but not in the sepulchres of the kings. So Jehoram, which is, this is what he was talking about, was 30, 32 years old. He reigned eight years, and he dies at the age of 40. Second Chronicles 22, verse 2, a little bit earlier than that. Um... Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah and the daughter of Omri. So, according to the KJV, Ahaziah starts reigning at 42. But that's a problem because Ahaziah is Jehoram's son. See the problem? Jehoram dies at 40. Ahaziah, according to the KJV, re uh, starts ruling at 42 years old. So, how does that work? How does the son become older than the father. That's the issue, which is, means it's an error. It's an error in the KJV. It's reporting to you an, an error in the, in the information. 
Now it's funny because the ESV in this case does a better job. Let's go to the ESV. It says Ahaziah was 22 years old when he began to reign. See, they caught it. They caught that mistake. Because again, the, the Septuagint, this is Septuagint, Ahaziah began to reign when he was 22 years old, or 20 years old, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. So it says 20 years old, um, ESV, Ahaziah was 22 years old. Either way, they're both correct in the, in the, they're more correct in the sense that it's possible, right? You can't be older than your father. That doesn't make any sense. But notice again that there's a contradiction here. Like in 2 Kings 8 verse 26, it says Ahaziah was 22 years old when he began to reign and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah. She was a granddaughter of Omri of King of Israel. This is ESV. If we go to KJV, 22 years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. Well, wait a minute. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles 22 verse 2. 40 and 2 years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. How does that work? Which one is it? Well, obviously it's not 42, because you can't be older than your father. So it must be that 2 Kings 8 verse 26 is correct in the KJV. It's a possible age. And that the other one is an error. But if that's an error, all you KJV onlyists, then verbal inspiration is not accurate. It's not something that's true. The words aren't verbally inspired because you have errors. You have actual errors in the translation. So there you go. Now, again, compare it to the Septuagint. If we go to Septuagint on the Second Kings, uh, Second Kings 8, 26, 20 and 2 years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. So it seems that the Septuagint is the one that is being cited from. However, the Septuagint has a little bit of a, an error also when it says in Second Chronicles 22, verse 2, that he began to reign at 20 years old. So you see, that's interesting, too. The Septuagint has a different age here as well. But either way, they're both possible. That's the point. You can't rule when you're older than your father. So what's the point when it comes to important verses with numbers, prophecy, and anything that you feel is of consequence in the Old Testament, always double-check the Septuagint. It's always handy to hand to have a copy of the Septuagint. Now, back to the story. So... You have 750 years of missing history, minimum, because of this corruption of the, of the genealogies. Now, this timeline issue means that the flood was probably around 3100 BC, not 2350 BC. This explains why the pyramids were built on sediment fossil layers, because now we have time for everything to happen. 750 years is plenty of time for the Tower of Babel, to be constructed for repopulation of the earth, for building up various nations, so on and so forth. Now we have a timestamp in the uh, person of Peleg, who was Eber's son. Eber's uh, Hebrew comes from Eber, but Peleg uh, was Eber's son, and Peleg means division, meaning Peleg was born during the events of the Tower of Babel. So that is a living time marker that we've that we've had. Now, Josephus agrees with this. So if we consult Josephus really quick, and this is from, again, like antiquities, and it's all cited in, um, in the references, but this is from his antiquities, and he says, Heber begat Joatan and Phaleg. He was called Phaleg, Peleg, because he was born at the dispersion of the nations to their several countries. For Phaleg among the Hebrews signifies division. So Josephus agrees that the reason Peleg was named Peleg, that could be pronounced Peleg or Peleg, I don't know. Either way, the reason this person was named this name is because his birth coincided with the issue of the Tower of Babel. Now, that's a very important time marker because now we can say, okay, well, how many years has it been since the flood and all these genealogies and people that lived up until Peleg? How many years was that? Well, We'll see in just a second. But according to the Masoretic timeline, this is the problem. There's only about 100 years difference between the flood and the birth of Peleg when the Tower of Babel happened. Do you understand the problem? There's not enough time in 100 years for the world to repopulate, to build the Tower of Babel, to build pyramids and all this kind of stuff. The atheist argument is that, well, you know, at a population growth of average of 3.2%, which is pretty aggressive for population growth, 
that's about eight people in 100 years, which means 186 people total. So from, so I'm sorry, from eight people from Noah's Ark in 100 years at 3.2 population percent growth, you have a total of 186 people, which obviously is not enough to build nations, the Tower of Babel and all these different things. It's nonsense. So the atheists have a point. They say, look, there's no way this could have happened. Your Bible is corrupt. It's wrong. It's, it's reporting to you. But of course, they don't realize the issue is the translation. It's not the information God has given you. The information is perfect and it's very accurate. If you use the Septuagint genealogies, then you have about 400 years plus of history between the flood and the birth of Peleg. At 3.2%, 400 years starting with eight people reproducing, you have, just guess, guess a number in your mind right now and see, if, see what you think it is. In 400 years, the number that you have is 2 million people at 3.2%, which is an, it's an average growth rate of a very aggressive growth rate, but it's, it's a realistic growth rate. And of course, people were much more robust than physically, let's put it that way. So they're reproducing probably much more robustly than they are today. So it could be even more than that because our population growth is based on today. Do you understand? Either way, using today's numbers, 3.2% with eight people over 400 years, you have what? 2 million plus people in 400 years. Is that enough for a Tower of Babel incident? Yes. Is that enough for multiple nations to be built and dispersed? Absolutely. The Tower of Babel incident happened around 2700 BC, give or take. Then you have another 250 years after that until basically the first pyramid, the, the Pyramid of Saqqara, which is around 2450 BC. And now you have everything reconciled. You have the history of the secular people who are saying, oh, well, this is when the pyramids were done. That's reconciled. You have God's word is true. You have everything in alignment, which of course, what does that result in? It results in the Masoretic being the one that's the problem. The Masoretic is corrupt. All the points of evidence point to the same conclusion, which is that history and the Bible agree with the Septuagint and people who are citing the Bible. So the Masoretic is corrupt. The ages that they give here eliminated 750 years of history. But now the question is very important. Why? Why did this corruption happen? Is there an agenda? Was it just a ton of scribal errors that just accumulated? Or was it a very deliberate agenda that has to do with attacking Christ and changing eschatology for the Jews? That's what we find out up next in part six, the motive.